Um, what I'd like to do today is uh, kind of take you on a personal journey of what exactly was going on in my life at the time that made it so significant for me to need the AMI program as much as I did. But before I do that, and because Jim extended the time limit a little bit, I want to share a little, a little story. Um, on my coat, I have this pen, and it's MAD, which stands for Made a Difference. And my first year tutoring at Bowie Junior High in Odessa, uh, in Ector County, one of my students came up to me at the Abbott celebration and he said, Mr. Brown, we were told to take these pins to one of our teachers and to pin them on their shirt and tell them that they had made a difference. And he proceeded, me, he proceeded to tell me the story of this young man who was the most popular kid at school. And he was the captain of the football team and all the girls loved him. And he was walking home one day and he seemed the most nerdiest kid at school being picked on by some bullies. And he walked past and didn't do anything about it and went on home. And the next day when he sat in class, the nerdiest kid in school wasn't in his science class. And when he went on to his next class, the nerdiest kid in school wasn't in his math class. And so as he went out to the hallway for lunch, he noticed that the nerdiest kid in school had all his books in his hand. And when the most popular kid in school started walking home again that day, he saw the nerdiest kid in school with all his books in his hand walking home. And he noticed that these bullies were coming up again and they started to pick on him. And the most popular kid in school went up to him and defended him. And the nerdiest kid in school looked at him and he said, he said, why do you have all your books in your hand? And he said, well, I wanted to take all my books home today because I didn't want my mom to have to pay for them. I was going to go home and kill myself. But because you defended me, you made a difference. And I know I wasn't going to go home and kill myself, but Mary Catherine, because of the decisions that you have made in creating this organization and providing the opportunity to everyone that you had, I would like to be She has, she has definitely made a tremendous difference, but I guess the easiest way to begin is to start from the beginning. When I was about five years old, my mom took my little brother and I to a playground park in Lampasas, Texas. And we were there with some friends, having a good time, hanging out. And uh, my mother pulled me to the side and said, I want to go across the street to a Winn-Dixie to get some groceries for a picnic. And I want you and your little brother to stay at the park. And that wasn't anything unusual for us. Mom always left and was gone but she always came back. And my friends were at the park, so of course I wanted to stay. So my brother and I stayed, and my mom left. And we continued to play with the kids, having a good time, and eventually it started to get late, and the kids started to trickle off and go home. And then it was just me and my brother left at the park, and my mom never came back. So for the next two nights, me and my little brother spent sleeping at this park, and on the second night, a police officer came by, and he asked me, he said, what are you doing, where are your parents? And of course, I didn't want to get my mom in trouble, so I told him that we had ran away from the babysitter. The police officer took us to where I told him the babysitter lived and figured out what was going on. Needless to say, I spent the next 14 years of my life growing up in foster care. Now, growing up in foster care was very difficult for Tiger and I because we learned at a very young age that we had no father and our mother didn't want us. So we figured out that no one could tell us what to do. You see, the only thing that we could count on, they made us live in places with people who looked nothing like us, who talked nothing like us, who acted nothing like us. They even told us where to sleep and what to eat and, and even who to call mom and dad. But the one thing we could control was our behavior and we manipulated it in a negative way. You see, when Tiger would be acting up, I would be acting up. When Tiger would be yelling and cursing at the foster mom, I would be yelling and cursing at the foster dad because that was the one thing that we could control. And it got so bad that eventually a judge decided to split us up. And that's where our lives went two completely different directions. When I was about nine years old, I was sitting in an ISP, which is an assessment of the foster child in a new home. And my caseworker came in with this letter from this lady named Marsha Grant. I got kind of excited because I knew it was from my mom. You see, she had missed a few visits that we were supposed to have. And I figured, well, at least she wrote me a letter. And one of the most valuable things in foster care that you could have, other than a picture, is a letter from a family member. My caseworker proceeded to sit me down and read the letter, and in the letter it said, I feel that Jonathan's life will be better lived and better afforded in foster care. And I didn't understand what that meant. And so my caseworker explained to me, that is your mother relinquishing her rights. She is no longer your mom. And I couldn't 
figure out how one day she was my mom. And the next day, just because a judge decided, she just stopped being my mom. So I started to build this animosity and this frustration and this hatred towards these people who I thought took me away from my mother. And I got very good at building walls. Very good at building walls. And I got very good at keeping people out because the hardest pain to feel for me was breaking another tie or breaking another relationship. And so for me, it was a lot easier to hate everyone that I lived in the foster home with than it was to build a relationship with them because eventually I would have to move. When I got into middle school, it was probably the most difficult years of my life simply because I was developing as a young man. So I was generally the more bigger kid in class. So anytime a problem presented itself to me, I dealt with it physically, whether it be with a friend or a peer or a teacher or sometimes even a principal. You see, in middle school, I was a kid who would sit in the back of the classroom and I'd be laughing and talking, cutting up with my friends. And the teacher would be writing away on the board and she'd turn around and she'd say, Jonathan, I need you to be quiet. I'm up here trying to teach and all you're doing is disrupting my class. Oh, no. I'd get out of my chair, flip it backwards. Miss, I don't even know why you're talking to me like that because all those other kids over there are laughing and talking too and you want to pick me out of the whole group and put me on blast? And then I'd storm out of the classroom and slam the door behind me and then peek through that little window, make sure everybody saw me and slowly walk to the principal's office, thinking, please let somebody come around the corner, please. Because I was ready to fight someone who had nothing to do with my problems because I kept building these walls. And the only way I knew to express my emotions was physically. When I got into high school, I was presented with another problem. That problem is when you turn 18 in foster care, at the time, you must be removed from the home. You are no longer in state's care. And that's pretty stereotypical in American society, right? When you, spread your, when you turn 18, what are you supposed to do? Spread your wings and fly, right? Go out into the world and see what it has for you. But in a normal American home, you can always come back to your mom's house for your birthday, for Thanksgiving, for Christmas, or just because. In foster care, you couldn't. So at 18, I figured I would no longer have a guaranteed place to sleep. I would no longer have a guaranteed place to live. I would no longer have a guaranteed place to eat. So for me, graduating from high school wasn't a goal. It wasn't something that I wanted to accomplish because for me, graduating from high school meant the end. It was over. Halfway through my freshman year in high school, I was introduced to the AVID program, and believe it or not, my Algebra two teacher nominated me for it. He was one of those math teachers that thought he was way too cool. He came into the classroom the first day of school and said, Ladies and gentlemen, my name is David Dabble. I want y'all to call me D-squared. Oh, man. <laughs> Mr. D-squared, I got you. That's my boy. Mr. D-squared, he's cool. And you see, I was good at math. I, got, I was very good at math, and so I was very successful in this class, and I attended this class on a regular basis. So for some reason, Mr. D-squared just assumed I was a good student. And he came up to me one day, and he said, Mr. Brown, I have this application for this program called Abbott. I think you'd be a very good candidate. That's about getting kids into college. And by this time in life, I got pretty good at telling people what they wanted to hear. So I told Mr. Deesley, like, yeah, I got you. I'm gonna go ahead and, and, and take care of this interview. And what I figured I would do is not go and then come back the next day and tell Mr. D Square, man, you set me up. They don't want somebody like me. How you gonna do me like that, Mr. D Square? And so as I left the classroom, I crumpled up the application and I threw it away. Well, the next day, Mr. D Square had that crumpled up application taped to my locker with a little note. <laughs> with a little sticky note that said, you will go to this interview, D squared. <laughs> so I took the crumpled up application and went, in, went on to the Abbott classroom. And that's where I met Paige Tomlin, the Abbott teacher. And I walked into her classroom and I told her, miss, I don't think I'm supposed to do something with this. And she said, yeah, you're right, come here. And so I laid the crumpled up application on her desk and she picked it up and crumpled it back up and threw it away. I said, okay, I just proceeded to walk out. She's like, no, hold on, here's a new one. Go out in the hallway, fill it out. And when you're ready, come see me. So I went out in the hallway and I filled it out and I came back in. And we started to talk about things I like to do, places I like to go, people I like to hang out with. And I was telling her what I thought were all the right answers. And then the conversation got a little serious. You see, I had never told anyone outside of the foster care system that I was a foster child because I was so ashamed and so embarrassed of the fact that my mother didn't want me and I didn't know my father. The most embarrassing thing that ever happened to me in my life was eighth grade. I was coming into history class after lunch 
and the intercom comes on, and it's the nurse, and she says, can you please send Jonathan to the clinic to take his medication? And everyone started laughing at me. Crazy guy, crazy John got to go take his crazy pills. And I was embarrassed, and I was frustrated, and I was angry. So I didn't want anyone to know that my mother didn't want me and that I didn't know my father. So I would make up these lies and these stories. But in this interview, Ms. Tallman asked me, she said, Jonathan, what do you want to do with your future? And I knew what to tell her. I knew to say I want to get a good job. I want to go to college, make lots of money so I can have a beautiful family. But I didn't tell her that. I said, Ms. Tallman, I don't have a future. I said, when I turn 18, I don't even have a family. So how could I possibly have a future? And I expected her to feel sorry for me because that's usually the response that you get when you tell someone something like that poor kid, whatever you need, we'll take care of it for you. But I never wanted anyone to feel sorry for me. I just wanted to be a regular kid with regular kid problems. Because if I was a regular kid, then no one would ask questions, and no one would figure out that I was an orphan. Ms. Tomlin didn't feel sorry for me. She said, you know what, Jonathan, there's going to be a lot of obstacles in life that you're going to have to go through, I'm going to have to go through, that's going to make us sit back and think, God, why did it have to happen to me? I was only five years old when my mom left me in that part. My brother was three. Why me? But she said, you know what, it's those people who go through those struggles in life. They overcome those obstacles. Those are the types of people who would create a brighter future for themselves because their life is valuable to them. And I realized for a long point in my life, it wasn't valuable to me. You could send me to ISS. You could tell me you're going to call the cops. You can move me to a different foster home. I didn't care because I had nothing to lose. I had nothing to invest in. Going through the AVID program, I began to put value into my life. And I graduated from high school, went on to college, graduated, graduated from college, and got a pretty good job. I'm still working on that nice family. <laughs> but you see, it's frustrating to think that two brothers can grow up in the same place and have the same thing happen to them, but wind up in two completely different directions. I talked a little bit about Tiger. You see, I went on to the Browns home, who at 17 adopted me, and then I graduated from high school, and then went on to college, and graduated from college, and got a good job. My little brother went to a boys' group home, and then to a mental institution, and then for the past five years, he's been locked up in prison. And it's frustrating to think that although we can find those Jonathans of the world who finally get it, we still lose those tigers. You see, today in our nation, we have sort of this sickness, this flu-like symptom that is for some reason is keeping us down economically, for some reason is keeping us down socially, and we have this sickness. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here today to tell you the cure. You are the cure. Because with this college degree, with this high school degree, they can take away my name, they can take away my family, they can take away my house, and they can take away my car, but they cannot take away my degree. It is educators like yourselves who instill the knowledge of success in people like me that is the cure for our nation's sickness. So it is, a, it is our responsibility, it is our duty to stay focused, to stay motivated, to soak in the information that we need in order to go back into our school districts, in order to go back to our, administrative, our administrators and our faculty and tell them, hey, guess what? We got the cure. We're no longer going to be sick. We're no longer going to be tired. We're no longer going to be last or lost. We're going to find those Jonathans, and we're going to find those Tigers, and we're going to help them succeed because you are good enough. And once you share your, inform your information and knowledge with us and we obtain that degree, we are good enough to have whatever future we want. So as you embark in the next few days in this conference, I encourage you, I challenge you to stay focused to stay dedicated and learn how to administer the cure that is inside you. Thank you so much.